Was today's her second yard site, and this is Bluma Baze Wolf. So two very special women in our lives, and uh, may their memory be uh, married to us all and uh, propel us to greater heights and accomplishments and achievements. Um, so first thing uh, I want to do is to apologize to everybody uh, for luring you in on a false pretense. Um, the name of the, of the shear is pain is, uh, as is it advertised, is the pay, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. This is a misnomer. Uh, what it should have been called is, is pain, pain is inevitable is okay. I would have preferred to call it pain is real, uh, but pain is inevitable is all right. But suffering, I would have liked to say suffering is imaginary, or maybe even suffering is self-inflicted. But I know that if I called it that, nobody would show up because everybody would take offense to me calling their suffering imaginary and self-inflicted. But I hope that I can shed some light on why I feel that way. And uh, again, I apologize if uh, you came here to know why it's only optional, and I'm going to tell you something slightly different. Um, I also want to say that this class, even though it does have a name, Spain and Suffering, in the in the title is not going to address the questions of why the suffering, why bad things happen to good people. We're certainly not going to touch a subject of Holocaust, for example, um, simply because I always uh, take uh, my uh, teacher's Lubavitcher Rebbe's guidance on this, and that is what can I possibly tell you about the Holocaust that would make it okay? There's nothing I can tell. There's nothing I can say about the meaning of suffering and uh, what, what not for you to go, oh, that explains the six million dead Jews. So we're not going to touch that. We're going to talk about suffering on a personal level. We're, talking, we're going to talk about pain and suffering that every one of us encounters in a day-to-day -day life. So first, let's define the terms. Pain. Pain is a default human condition. Pain is inevitable because everybody encounters pain. There's not a person in the world that is impervious to pain. We all know of toothaches. We all know of belly aches. We all know of heartaches, both uh, infractions and uh, heartbreaks by grief and loss and lost loves. We all know of, we all know of pains of consciousness. That is a real pain. Feelings of guilt is real. In the very beginning of this story of you, humankind, in the book of Genesis and Bracious, after Adam and Chava have sinned with the fruit uh, of the uh, tree of knowledge, God uh, gives them a very severe admonition. And part of the admonition that he addresses to the woman he says to her, to the woman he said, I will greatly increase your sorrow and your pregnancy. You will give birth to children with pain. Pain, right away. And in fact, Rashi, the commentator on, on, uh, uh, on the Torah, uses the word pain three times in explaining this posuk. He says that your sorrow refers to tsar gidul bonim, the pain of raising children, of rearing children. I will, it says, I will increase your pregnancy. That refers to tsaro ibur, the pain of pregnancy. And you will give birth to children with pain. That, of course, is tsaro leida, the labor pains. So, and that's to the woman. To the man, God says, in sorrow you shall eat from it all the days from your life. It will grow, the earth will grow thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the herbs of the field. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread. That doesn't sound appetizing at all. That sounds very painful. The thorns and the thistles and the pay and the sweat of your face. So pain is a default human condition. When we talk, when Hebrew word for pain is tsar. Tsar. Suffering, on the other hand, is a mental and emotional anguish. It is not a physical feeling. It's a state of mind, and it's a state of heart. 
asking why, asking why me, asking why now. All of that is suffering. So can there be pain devoid of suffering? And the answer is, of course. There's no question that pain and suffering don't have to go hand in hand. And, what, and, and the clearest reason is the very first pain that we mentioned, is the pain, labor pains. It's a tremendous uh, uh, pain, very painful experience, as far as I can tell. You know, I'm just, I'm getting off cold, and uh, you know, when a man has a cold, I'm sorry, when a woman is in labor, this is the closest she will come to understand the man when he has a cold. <laughs> Why? Because when a man has a cold, we assign tough suffering to this pain. We suffer tremendously. When a woman is in labor, she's rejoicing. My mother had a very difficult pregnancy with me. My mother, Oleo Asholem, who is yours to this today, has a had a tremendously difficult pregnancy. She had to be bed on bed rest. She has to be hospitalized for the last months of the pregnancy. The labor itself was excruciating, so much so that my mother told my father, after giving birth to me, never again. Never again. I'm never doing this again. Incidentally, eight years later, she gave birth to twins. But, uh, you know, that's because man plans and God laughs. But she said never again. But it never, ever crossed my mother's lips. And I'm sure it never, never crossed my mother's mind, as far as I know her, to regret having me. So the pain of labor was not connected with suffering, with regret, with asking why. My wife, who's here, thank God, gave birth to most of my children. No, in fact, all of my children. And uh, her last pregnancy with twins was also very difficult. She almost died, God forbid. I asked her the other day, I said, do you regret for one moment having the twins, having to go with it, through, through with it? She said, are you crazy? Never. So this is the clearest example of unimaginable pain, worse than a man having a cold, that's not connected, completely devoid of suffering. There is no mental anguish. There is no emotional pain that goes along with it. I'll give you another example. We are told to serve God with joy. So, which means that every mitzvah, every commandment that we do, we're supposed to rejoice in doing it. So it's easy to understand uh, how you can rejoice in keeping Shabbos. Shabbos is full of cholent. Shabbos is full of singing. Shabbos is full of uh, lechayims for those that enjoy that part of life. And Shabbos is lovely. Davening, if you're into that kind of thing, prayer could be very enjoyable. And you certainly can master up praying with joy. You can train yourself to do it. But what about eating bitter herbs on Pesach? When we eat bitter herbs on Pesach, it's supposed to remind us of bitterness. It's supposed to remind us of the hardships that the Jews suffered in Mitzrayim and Egypt. Nonetheless, this is one of the mitzvahs. You're supposed to eat it with joy. So we see that pain and going <clears throat> from the, all the chrein and all the horseradders that we're eating, as the Zohar says, you can have sadness and pain in your heart on one side, and you can joy on the other side simultaneously. So we see that pain and suffering do not go hand in hand necessarily. So what happens? So what happens is this. This is my rendition of suffering. In Eastern philosophies, there is a concept of sukkah, differently from a Jewish sukkah. Sukkah is a perfectly balanced wheel. There is a wheel, and the hub of the wheel is exactly in the center of the wheel. And when your wagon, when your car, when your life's journey is running on these kind of wheels, and perfectly running wheels, your journey, your, your journey is smooth, and your journey is not perturbed, you're just rolling. You're just rolling with it. That is because your hub is exactly in the center. What happens, though, if your hub is misaligned? This, they say, is called dukkha. And dukkha is traditionally translated as suffering. I don't know if it's Tibetan language, but it's uh, dukkha. 
What's dukkah? Dukkah is your hub is misaligned, and what happens to your will? Boom. It goes up and it goes down. And as you are sitting in your in your chariot and on your cushion, you go up and you go down, and it's bumpy and it's not smooth sailing. This idea of not smooth sailing is suffering. Because every time it happens, you go, ah, I don't believe this. My journey is not smooth. So we're not talking about events that are earth shattering. We're talking about little things. Baby crying on a plane next to you. Unbearable suffering for many people. Unbearable. So much so people get, nowadays we have everything on a smartphone. You can look up videos of people being kicked off the planes because they make a scene because there was a three-year-old next to them. A three-year-old is not going to cry all night. How about an eight-month-old baby that is going to cry all night on a plane next to you? Unbearable suffering. Uh, Jewish wisdom says that, that Jewish suffering is also from a minuscule thing like this. You put a, you put a hand in your pocket looking uh, for a coin, knowing you have a coin in your pocket, and you expect to pull out a dollar, a dollar coin, and instead you pull out a nickel. That's suffering, says Jewish wisdom. That's suffering. I don't want to minimize suffering. I just want to say that suffering is available to us on any level that, where we can look for it. So if so, you might say so model. Suffering is inevitable then. Then suffering is also inevitable. If everything, if every upheaval, if every bump on the road, if every instance of not smooth sailing causes us to suffer, then suffering is also inevitable. And here is the difference between the pain and the suffering. <laughs> With pain, both the encounter of pain and the experience of pain is inevitable. We're not impervious to pain. Pain will always come. There will always be pain. And there is not a person in the world who cannot feel that. Even people who don't have any uh, nerves going to their extremities, and there is a condition like that, and by the way, it's terrible, and I will explain in a second why, but you can guess why. Uh, even they are prone to stomach aches, to heartbreaks. So pain, encounter with pain is inevitable, and experience of pain is inevitable. Whereas suffering, the encounter with suffering is inevitable too. That is true. The encounter of suffering, our ability to assign suffering to every painful experience is infinite. We can definitely suffer as much as we would like, as much as we can allow ourselves to. But the experience of suffering is not inevitable. We can avoid experience and suffering. And this is something that I want to talk about today. Pain will always be there, can't avoid it, will always feel it. Suffering, you can put it hand in hand with your pain and have, you and have yourself experience both, thereby exacerbating your pain, making your painful experience that much more terrible. You can, as my teacher, one of my teachers, one of my heroes, Jordan Peterson says, you can turn tragedy into hell by assigning suffering to it. There are tragic experiences, there are terrible things that are happening to us that are very painful. But if we assign suffering to it, if we also suffer, we assign mental and emotional anguish to it, we can turn it into a hellish experience. And so this is something I'd like to address today. So pain by itself is actually good. And don't hate me for it. It's not my idea. Pain is an instrument of course correction. How else are you going to know not to touch a hot pot if when you grab it, it's not going to be painful to you? Again, people without nerving, nerve endings in their hands, they burn themselves to the bone because they don't know to pu pull their hand away after touching something hot. This is a terrible thing. It's a very difficult condition to live with. You know, if you bump into a wall, you know to change course. Pain is an instrument of horse corre course correction. So a horse who is being reined on a straight path would be stupid to say, I hate the wagon driver for pulling on the reins and maybe causing me some pain. Because by doing that, the wagon driver is actually keeping me away from the thorns and the thistles and the walls and stepping into things I shouldn't be stepping in. So yes, it may be a painful experience, 
but it is a necessary experience. The same with pangs of, pangs of conscience, with guilt. Guilt is an internal instrument God instilled into us to know when we violated our, our, our moral compass, our own standard. This is guilt. Guilt is healthy. Yes, it's painful to feel guilty. It's painful to do something wrong and feel guilty. But it's only antisocial types that don't feel guilty after doing something wrong. Normal people but for, by whom this instrument has not been corrupted and was proper, properly installed according to the factory settings, guilt is great. Guilt tells you when you did something wrong so you can choose a course correction. So what are some of the other examples of suffering that we can bring? Well, one is, like I said, the baby on the plane. And the reason that we assign, I say assign suffering to it, because while it is unpleasant, and it may be disturbing your dream, your sleep, it is not a given that it needs to drive you nuts. In fact, of the 300 people on the plane, it's just one who goes completely out of their way to be thrown so much that they're thrown out of the plane because of the crying baby. Which means the rest of us can actually mitigate that pain and not assign to it so much, as much suffering as this other person. So we see that suffering is actually generated by us, within us. If I'm envious of my boss's job or my boss's office, my boss's tie. Is it his problem or is it my problem? It may be painful that I was bypassed by a promotion and somebody who I didn't feel deserved it became my boss after being my colleague for 20 years and being an inferior colleague at that. And I'm talking about real, real stuff, measurable stuff. For whatever reason, he got promoted ahead of me. So my envy, my jealousy, my self-pity, is it generated by him or is it generated by me? And can I learn to mitigate it? And can I learn? So who's assigning suffering to the pain? The experience is painful. I was bypassed. I was wronged. If it's not right, I would prefer to have a different job. But if I keep losing sleep over it, if I'm spending all my free time bad-mouthing the boss, if I'm spending all my free time complaining and feeling sorry for myself, suffering that, I inf that is inflicted upon me is inflicted upon me by me, not by him, not by the person that promoted him. They inflicted pain on me. Not the suffering. This is why, so pain is the, could be devoid of suffering, and pain could also be positive. Childbirth, working out until you are, uh, uh, you know, everything aches. That is great pain, you know? Some people love uh, the heartache from, uh, from a breakup. It hurts so good, it's a famous song, you know? So pain could be a positive experience. When is pain a negative experience? When it goes hand in hand with suffering, and especially when it goes hand in hand in suffering that's inflicted on us by ourselves. But. There is suffering that could inflict it on us by others as well. That is true. For example, slavery in Egypt, Shibud Mitzrayim. The slavery in Egypt, says the free, previous Lubavitch Rebbe, oh, by the way, let me take, I noticed my daughter distributing uh, uh, index cards, and I just want to tell you uh, why that is. And I, I think, Havala, we need them on the women's side as well. Um, you have two business index cards in front of you and a pencil. Uh, you can use one to jot down questions if you need, so that you can ask me them at the end if you have any questions. The other one we're going to do something with, so please leave one card um, empty. So in Shibut Mitzrayim, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe says the, the, the horrors of that slavery were not because of the back-breaking labor. Jews were not novices when it came to back-breaking labor. We were shepherds. We came from hard uh, work, uh, from waking up early, from running after our cattle, from being nomads in the desert. We did not shy from hard labor. Yes, they transferred us from being a shepherd to being a construction worker, but people get used to the transition in their careers that I can attest to. You get over it, and you go from a fishmonger to a therapist and like this, in no time at all. 
So they went from being a shepherd to being, to being a construction worker. What's the problem? Why was it such a terrible uh, uh, slavery? Because it was meaningless. It was utterly meaningless. The Egyptians made them build today only to demolish tomorrow what they built and then to build it again and demolish the day after. Because it was utterly meaningless, that's why uh, this pain was also imbued with suffering. And this is why we say, for example, about the pain that's inflicted on us in hell after 120 years, we refer to this as suffering as well. And that is because in hell, there is no, you look back and we say, I could have avoided all of this. We could have avoided that. How, why, why am I suffering with this? I'm not, I can't get out of it. There's nothing I can do. Uh, there's no parole. There's no early uh, uh, release. It's suffering because there's no getting out of it. And there's no meaning in it. It's completely meaningless. So what Viktor Frankl has found after studying people in concentration camps is that pain that was absolutely unbearable in concentration camps, and I told you we're not going to talk about Holocaust, but how, how can a Jew talk about pain and suffering and not mention the Holocaust? Uh, the pain that was inflicted on the Jews was unbearably deadly to those whose suffering had no meaning. So there is a quote that is attributed widely to Frankel, but it's actually Nietzsche who said it first. And that is, a man who has a why can bear almost any how. A man, it bears repeating, if you haven't heard this before. A man who has a why can bear almost any how. If you have a reason for your suffering, you can mitigate your suffering, you can assign it properly, you can explain your pain, then your suffering is not suffering, really. And then you can bear the pain. If you have a why, if you have a reason for your pain, you can bear any how. You can bear any infliction of it. Which is why you don't hate your personal trainer. You don't hate your personal trainer. So having said that, we will now understand, I hope, uh, what, says, what it says in uh, Jewish books, Ein ra yoyred milmailo. Nothing bad descends from above. Nothing bad descends from above. God doesn't send us bad thing. God is not bad things. God is not a tyrant. God doesn't torture Jews. God forbid. The reason that we say that is because pain inherently is not bad. So when we say ein ra, ra being bad, the word for bad, we're not saying ein tsar. We're not saying no pain descends from above. So no, nothing bad descends from above. Ein ra yoyred milmailo, because pain is not inherently ra. Pain is not inherently bad. Pain is an instrument of course correction. Pain is an instrument of cleansing. Pain is an instrument of advancement. Pain is an instrument of, of overcoming challenges and becoming stronger as a result. So when pain comes our way, we do not ask, why me, God? We embrace it. We acknowledge it. Maybe even we say thank you. I've worked with many cancer patients. And the experience that you cannot imagine, probably, if you haven't had it, is sitting across a person with cancer, perhaps even in advanced stages, who says, thanks to cancer, and then they tell you what it is that they either realized or accomplished or have done, thanks to cancer. Not because of cancer, not despite cancer, thanks to cancer. I've worked with many addicts who identify themselves as grateful for their addictions. How can it be? Well, the reason is because pain and suffering are two different things. Suffering is bad. Suffering is right, and God does not send suffering down here. He sends pain. He sends pain for good reasons, for his reasons. Suffering at the hands is of our own doing. So, if this is true, I have a problem with that. 
Because the same book that says, Ein ra yorid mil the same book that says, God does not send suffering, does not send anything bad to come ours, to come our way. It says in Tilim, Rabbis, Rois, Tzadik. A righteous person has many bad things happen to them. <laughs> One second, is there nothing? It's the same word, Ra, Ra, Rois. Either nothing bad comes from above, or there are many bad things that happen to a tzaddik. Pick one. It can be both, at least not at first glance. Moreover, when we daven shacharis, we say, Yoitzi roir, uvoire choyshech, oise sholem uvoire sakoil. You created light, you formed light and created darkness, you make peace and create everything. This is a praise of God. This is actually a verse from Isaiah, from Isaiah. And did you know that this verse has been changed by the people who wrote our prayer books? That the actual quote from Isaiah reads like this. You form light and you create darkness. You make peace and you create bad. So again, is it no bad come from above or do you create bad? So the very simple reading, we also have to understand why the change uh, in the Siddur, in the prayer book, but the very simple reading of the Posuk is explained by the commentators to mean that he, Yoitzir Oir, he forms light for the Jews, Uboire Choyshech, and creates darkness for Babylonians. In this day, in the days of Yeshaya. Oise Sholem, he makes peace for the Jews, avoid Ra, and creates badness for those that transgress his will. So we see that there is Ra, there is badness that comes from above, but it comes as a punishment for uh, uh, evildoers. And in fact, again, if we dig a little bit deeper, which I'm not going to do today, you, may, you can also see it as a course correction. Right? In other words, in many instances, a person, in order to, to attempt a course correction, to attempt a character change, to attempt a behavior change, they need to hit what is called rock bottom. They need to really be hurting. If they're not hurting, they will, not, they will probably not think to change. But know that I have some colleagues here who have seen it, who have seen it in, with, their, with their own eyes, and that unless the person is really, really hurting, a behavior change, a character change, is really not possible. But, so God sends bad. He sends suffering. He sends, but it's not a very good understanding. It's not a very good explanation. Not a very good explanation, in my mind. In addition to that, we have another expression of our sages that reads, Smechim bi surim those who rejoice in suffering, they are compared to the ones who love God, who are in turn compared to the smite of the sun coming out in all its glory. Rejoicing in suffering? We just said suffering is self-inflicted. Why would you rejoice in something like this? This is a terrible idea. Don't suffer. Choose not to suffer. Don't assign suffering to your pain. Why rejoice in suffering? In addition to that, what is the connection between rejoicing and suffering being called a lover of God, somebody who loves God? Oy havov. Kitsei sashem is big vorosi. So again, commentators say that those who rejoice in suffering, what our sages mean when they say that, those who rejoice in suffering, they really refer to those who accept suffering with love. They accept suffering. So then their rejoicing is not masochistic. They don't love being hurt. But they accept it with love because they understand it's a loving father who is administering the uh, beating. It's a loving father who is administering the slap across the face. Or maybe a slap on the hand when the baby is reaching for something that is dangerous. A slap of the hand will cause the baby to cry. But it's much better than putting your fingers into an electric outlet. 
So that's, again, the simple meaning of this, of this expression, smechim be surim, those who rejoice in suffering. But I think we can, we can explain it a little bit better. So let's go back to the first problem that I had with Ein Ra Yored Mil Milo. Nothing bad comes from above. Rabbi Yisroi Sadik. It says in Tilim, a posuk in Psalms that says, uh, many are the bad things that happen, that happen to righteous. Radak, a great commentator, says as follows. Many times, God will test a righteous person. Many times, so in other words like this, when we are afflicted with, with pain, we might say this is a punishment for my wrongdoing, this is a course correction, this is you know, a reminder from God that he wants me to change my ways. So I can explain it when it comes to me. But when I'm looking at a righteous person who doesn't need the course correction as far as I'm concerned, who certainly doesn't need any pain because he's so determined for uh, improving himself and for becoming a better person, because these are people, righteous people are the ones that are working on themselves and overworking their character and doing <clears throat> everything they can to become better human beings uh, today than they were yesterday, why do they suffer? Why does that, do they have apparently bad things happen to them? So Radak says, many times God will test a righteous person in order to better him and to show others his righteousness. That even though this person is afflicted, he does not stray from the path. He does not give up. He does not throw his uh, hat, he does not throw the white towel into the ring. He doesn't give up. My Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Vichnin Olova uh, died of cancer, just like my mother did. He died of cancer in the summer of 95. And uh, for the past year, maybe last two years of his life, he was going through cancer, he was going through chemotherapy, he lost his hair, he lost his beard. He was joking that uh, now we can't tell the difference between a Rosh Hashiva and a student uh, because he didn't have a beard. He came to give classes. He, gave, he came to do his job at the yeshiva without skipping a beat. If he had to skip a beat, it was because he was hospitalized and was physically unable to attend. So this is when we knew, this is when the other administrators would come and say, we have to say till him, we have to pray for his uh, imp improvement. And so we would spend the, class, the time for class that he would ordinarily give, we would spend praying for him. Rabbi Vichnin would chew on painkillers while giving us classes. Rabbi Vichnin was taken uh, on a stretcher out of the yeshiva to the hospital where he died later that day. And on his stretcher, as he was on the stretcher being wheeled into the ambulance, he pulled over one of my classmates and he said, I arranged for you to go into the coil. That's what he thought about. I arranged for you to go to the high level of education because he was working on it. And said, don't worry, even if I die, I arranged for you to be accepted into the coil. So I don't know why a righteous person like Rabbi Vichnin, who survived Holocaust as a young child, had to suffer tremendous, sorry, sorry, had to suffer tremendously in the last days of his life. I don't know what God's plan was for it. But I know that as far as I am concerned, that was exactly the idea that Radak is explaining that by looking at him and seeing how a person can take his pain and not allow it to turn to suffering and not allow it to distract him from his, job, from his life's mission, I can learn from it. I can take, I can take example from it. So Rabbi Shroi's tzaddik is not the point of afflicting a tzaddik. It's not the point of torturing a tzaddik. It's a point that there is something for us to learn. Malbim says something different. Malbim is another commentator, and he actually says in the earlier postage, in the same capital, in the same chapter of the, of the Psalms, <coughs> there is a postage that says, Eine Hashem el tzadikim, the eyes of God are turned towards the righteous, the Oznav al and his ears are attuned to their pleas. So Malbim says, 
eyes of God that turn to the righteous because God makes sure that the righteous have everything they need. He looks after them. He's very careful in monitoring the life of the righteous person to make sure they get everything they need. But sometimes a righteous, even a righteous person, how much more us, might say, I don't have everything I need. I also would like something else that I don't currently have. Then the ears of God are tuned to their pleas because even then God answers their pleas and gives them what they ask for even though it's unnecessary. And even though what they're lacking or what they have and they consider it bad is not really bad because God only sends them good things. If only they consider something to be bad, they can pray and God will take it away from them because his ears are attuned to them. So even when badness is perceived only, in other words, Rabbi Yisrael is tzaddik, we're talking about the, the, the many afflictions of the righteous refers to perceived afflictions, not real afflictions. Because oftentimes, again, and this I think has to do with assigning suffering to pain. When your pain goes head in hand with, with suffering, with being um, uh, afflicted, then prayer helps. Then God will intervene. God will take it away from you as well. And so we have to differentiate between our own suffering and suffering of others. We have to differentiate between our own afflictions that we can explain by saying, maybe I deserve it. Maybe I need it. Maybe it's God tapping me on the shoulder and saying, hello, did you forget about me? There was a tzaddik in the 18th century, a big Hasidic rabbi, who suffered tremendously during his whole life. And whenever his situation would improve, he would say, Tata, did you forget about me? Because he knew that while he suffers, there is a connection between him and God. So every time his situation would improve, he says, did you forget about me? What's going on? Why am I doing well? He wanted a relationship with God. So when it comes to ourselves, we know. We know why we need pain. Sometimes we don't. But we can at least rest assured that there is a why. There is a why, even if we don't know what the answer to the why is. Why? Because God is good, and the nature of good is to do good, and everything that comes from God is good, and nothing bad descends from above. But when it comes to the suffering of others, there are two things that need to happen. One is, what can I learn from it? And the second is, we need to really complain about it. We really need to pray for this other person. We really need to demand of God to remove suffering from others. That is our duty. We need to try to alleviate suffering from others as much as possible, not to say, hey, you inflict your suffering on yourself. You are a master of your own misery. That's not up to us to say. It is our job to pray and demand that suffering from another Jew is removed. So what is the answer? What is the answer to suffering? What is the answer to not uh, to not assigning suffering to our pain? I think I came up with something. And that is acronym of the word sage. Now, this is not necessarily in this order, in the order in which it needs to be attempted. But it's the best I could come up with. And if you have a better way of putting it, please see me after this. Uh, see me after the show. <laughs> S stands for serenity. Not coincidentally, it's the name of my new center. Shameless self promotion right here. A step stands for acceptance. G is gratitude. And E is equanimity. I will explain each one as we go along. Serenity is not absence of the storm. It's not absence of the pain. Serenity is peace during the storm. 
Imagine, uh, I saw a meme once. Imagine a balloon, you know, a children's balloon, and it says the word happiness on it. And then there's a needle, sewing needle, and it says minor inconvenience. I don't want to minimize suffering, but we have to remember that we suffer from the littlest of things if we're not careful. If we don't work on, on being serene, then everything can pop our happiness balloon. If I go out in the morning to my car and somebody parked too close and I have to go, instead of, instead of smoothly you know, wearing out of my parking spot, now I have to go back and forth five times, it could throw me for a loop. My entire day could, could, could go down, you know, down in, in a hand basket. That is a little sewing needle, minor inconvenience, that pops my happiness balloon. What about stubbing your toe? What about spilling your drink? I had a shirt that was cursed. Every time I would put it on, I would spill coffee on it. It would drive me crazy until I realized it's a, sh it's a cursed shirt. There's nothing wrong with me or with coffee or with anything. I just have to remember that if I'm putting this shirt on, I have to have a spare in the car. That's serenity. Serenity is accepting suffering, accepting minor inconveniences for what they are. And one of the ways to measure how minor is the inconvenience is to ask yourself, will it matter in this much time? <laughs> so some people might say, well, nothing will matter in a, million, in a million years. So again, my hero, Jordan Peterson, says, any idiot can come up with a frame of reference that makes everything irrelevant. So we're not talking about million years. But ask yourself, will my having to pull out of my parking spot by going back and forth several times, will it matter in five minutes? And by the way, if it will matter, because you'll be late for work because of 30 second delay, there's something wrong with you, not with the person that parked too close. That's because you left your house too late. So don't blame the neighbor. So if it will matter in five minutes, okay, so maybe there is a little bit of an inconvenience there to you, and you can consider being uh, worked up over it. Will it matter in a day? Will it matter in five days? Will it matter in five months? Most things will not. Some things will. Divorce will matter in five years. So it's not a minor inconvenience. It's a painful experience. But you can turn the tragedy of divorce into hell if it's done with lack of serenity, with lack of acceptance, if it's done begrudgingly, with resentment, with envy, with, with anger, with fighting. Acceptance. There is a piece of literature that I admire. It's a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a basic text of the 12-step program that cured millions of people from alcoholism. And there's a wonder, wonderful passage in it about acceptance. I'd like to read it to you with your permission. The book is written by alcoholics for alcoholics. But I think there are some lessons in it that are universal. And I find this particular passage about acceptance to be very, very meaningful in my life. And it goes like this. Acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I'm disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some fact of my life, unacceptable to me. And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way it is supposed to be at this moment. Listen to what it says further. Nothing, absolutely nothing, happens in God's world by mistake. Bears repeating. Nothing, absolutely nothing, happens in God's world by mistake. Until I could accept my alcoholism, I could not stay sober. Unless I accept life completely on life's terms, I cannot be happy. I need to concentrate not so much on what needs to be changed in the world as on what needs to be changed in me and in my attitudes. So the attitude of acceptance is another answer to suffering. What about gratitude? What is the opposite of gratitude? Sense of entitlement. When you, are, when you feel you deserve something, when you feel you owed something, how can you be grateful for what you have? It's never enough. We just learned last week in, uh, on Pico Absolutely mind-boggling mimer of the Friedrich Rebbe, 
the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe's discourse, and exactly this concept. When a person, when a person's attitude to life is as kumt mer un as felt mer, magiyali vichaserli, I am owed, I'm entitled, and I'm lacking, how can you be happy? You, you are suffering because you don't have your boss's job, you don't have your boss's tie, the baby is crying next to you on the plane, you have a nickel in your pocket instead of a dollar bill, how can you be happy? When you deserve to have a dollar, you certainly deserve that corner office by God, how can you be happy? So Reb Aron Karliner, the great rabbi of Karlin Stolen, who actually died in a pogrom, he was killed by, by, um, by the anti-Semites. He has an unbelievable letter in which he decries depression. And he says, how can you be depressed when you draw breath? Just think about it. You're breathing. Every breath is a miracle. Every moment you're created anew with your breath. How can you be depressed? That's all you need to think about. If you're grateful for each breath, how can you be depressed over not having anything else? But we only start appreciating our breath when? When eczema kicks in. Enzema. Okay. Finally, equanimity. About equanimity, I would like to tell you a little story. There was once an old man and an old woman and uh, at the in their you know, midlife, they had a child, and by the time they were in their older years, the child, the son, was uh, old enough to help them uh, work, and he was tending to their field, and he was tending to their house, and they had a horse. And the horse was, uh, in those days, very, very important. So the son and the horse and the old man, they would work, and uh, you know the wife would be at home taking care of the house, and everything seemed quite well going for them until one day the horse ran away. The horse ran away. It's like your Cadillac being stolen, you know. It's not just any old Cadillac. It's actually it's it's like your 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 van, your, your work van uh, being stolen. Your plumber truck being stolen. They were left without. So neighbors came and neighbors expressed their condolences. And neighbors said, uh, "We're so sorry it happened to you. It's a terrible tragedy. We're so sorry that your horse ran away." And the old man said, maybe so, maybe not. So the next day, the horse came back. And not only it came back, it brought back a wild horse with it. It went out into the free pastures, it hooked up with another horse, and it brought it back to the old man's home. So the neighbors came and they said, wow, what blessing. Unbelievable, you are so lucky. Your muzzle just doubled. Your luck just, just doubled, you won a lottery. Not only your plumber truck came back, it also brought back a, 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 a roach coach, a lunch truck. And the old man said, maybe so, maybe not. The next day, the son was breaking in the new horse, and the horse kicked and threw him off, and he fell and he broke his hip. And the neighbors came and the neighbors said, oh, we're so sorry. This must be so hard on you. This is terrible. You were counting on this young man to get married, to have children, to take care of you in, all, in your old age. And now he's handicapped. He can't even take care of himself, let alone of the family, let alone of you. You're doomed to an old age of hunger and, and deprivation. And the old man said, maybe so, maybe not. The next day, a war break, broke out. And the king's army marched through the village, drafting every able young man to the war, except the old man's son, because he was lame. And all the neighbors came over, and they said, oh, wow, you are so blessed. You are so lucky. All our sons have been drafted to war, and who knows if they're going to come back, but your son will be here for you. If nothing else, a, 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 a handicapped son is better than no son. And the old man said, maybe so, maybe not. The story goes on. I can, take, I can tell all day telling you the story, but I think the moral is quite, underst quite understood. Equanimity is accepting what comes your way, 
exactly the way it is. It goes hand in hand with acceptance. It goes hand in hand with gratitude. It certainly goes hand in hand with serenity. There is a Hebrew term. There is a Torah term for every one of these words. Serenity is shalva. It's something we bless each other, we bless each other with. Acceptance. What's acceptance? I'm going blank. I probably will remember in a second. Gratitude is a Equanimity is ishtavus. Ishtavut. When you say, Hein v'lav shovin lei. The first Lubavitcher Rebbe says, it doesn't matter to us what God told us to do. Whether he put, told us to put on tefillin or he told us to chop wood. It doesn't matter. As long as it's God's will, we will do it as willingly, as happily, with as much joy. Hein v'lav shovin lei. What's the difference? God says, yeah, do that, no, do that. It's the same, equanimity. Something happened to me, terrible tragedy, maybe so, maybe not. And that's why there is a law in, the Jew, in, in, Jewish, in Jewish law that we make a blessing, we make a blessing for when bad things happen, the same way as we bless God for good things happening. Yes, the wording of the blessing is different. We recognize the difference between good things happening and bad things happening. We're not blind. We're certainly not blind to pain. But we recognize that if it comes from God, it must be good. And if it must be good, then what's to worry about? Equanimity is a very important concept. This is now we will understand why it says in Yeshaya, you make peace and you create badness. And why it was switched in the cedar and prayer, you create everything. Because God creates everything. He creates what we perceive as good and he creates what we perceive as bad. It's everything. So the oiseira is a misnomer. It's misleading. It really is. Oise akoil. Uboire akoil. Uboire esakoil. I'm sorry, this is the, the correct quote. Uboire esakoil. You create everything. Because everything comes from God. So the duality of good and bad is only present in this world, where there is darkness and there is light, where there is pain and there is absence of pain, where there is serenity and there is uh, tumult. By God, everything is one. Everything that comes from God is one. So the badness and the goodness, the perceived badness and the perceived goodness is all one. So boire ra is really more precise. Boire esakoil, you created everything. You didn't just create it. And therefore, we see nothing bad comes from above. So there is an added aspect to it. That a Jewish way of answer of saying when something happens is not to say maybe so, maybe not. We actually take it a step further. We say gamzuli toiva. And this is also for the good. We see ahead. We don't wait for things to unfold to know they will be good. We look at whatever is happening, we say, Gamzul this is also good. I uh, was traveling in Israel, and the first thing that happened, within the first three hours of my arriving, a uh, trunk of my rented car slammed on my head. Oh my God, it was so painful. It took me a few minutes to say thank you, God. <laughs> I didn't say it right away. But it's, it's important to recognize God's presence and everything that goes on. Here's the thing about equanimity. You have a problem. Do you have a problem? No? This is equanimity. 
This is a chart of equanimity right there. Can you see it? Therefore, when I will understand why smechim be surim, those who rejoice in suffering are called lovers of God. Because if you love God, then you, you don't enjoy suffering because you're a masochist. You understand that it's God's loving hand that is inflicting pain on you. So rejoicing in suffering doesn't mean to love your misery. It means to understand that it's really not suffering. Yes, it's painful, but you're smechim be surim. You are accept the surim, acceptance. You accept it with love, with joy, because it comes from a loving God. And if it comes from a loving God, it's done for your betterment, and it's meant to propel you to greater heights. I want to read you something. It's too good to paraphrase. Too good to paraphrase. <laughs> Even the most assiduous of parents cannot fully protect their children, even if they lock them in the basement, safely away from drugs, alcohol, and internet porn. In that extreme case, too cautious, too caring parent merely substitutes him or herself for the terrible problems of life. This is the great Freudian Oedipal nightmare. It is far better to render people in your care competent than to protect them. It is far better to render people in your life competent than to protect them. By teaching our children about pain and the inevitability of pain, by teaching ourselves about the inevitability of pain, we can protect ourselves from suffering. Because a lot of times suffering is self-inflicted by the idea that I am above pain. How, what is it about me that I'm getting pain? I should live a painless, pain-free existence. That is the opposite of acceptance. That is certainly the opposite of gratitude. This is a sense of false entitlement. Nobody but nobody is entitled to a pain-free existence. Adam and Chava were cursed with pain on the first day of creation. And I think maybe I misspoke when I said cursed with pain. I think we're prom they were promised pain. How could the nature of man ever reach its full potential without challenge and danger? How dull and contemptible would we become if there was no longer reason to pay attention? Maybe God, okay. Question for parents, do you want to make your children safe or strong? Safe or strong? You can't keep them safe. There's no way, no way. Not from the billboards, not from the people on the street. Not from their friends, not from when you are gone. Unless you are strong, unless they are competent, they will suffer. But suffering is, you can mitigate suffering. You can reduce suffering. So here comes the point of why I invited you to listen to me today. And that is, so what do we do about all of this? So we establish that pain and suffering and don't necessarily have to go hand in hand. We establish that, pain, that suffering is in large part self-inflicted. We establish that pain is actually good and that nothing bad uh, comes from above. And then we see other people suffer, we're supposed to do two things, learn from it and pray for that person and ask for that person to, to discontinue suffering and that we need to see our own pain and our own suffering as, as, as challenges that we need to overcome in order to become better people. So we start by returning to the center of our will and making our life that center. Because whenever the hub of our will is something else, money, prestige, family, career, friends, if any of other things are, se are centers of our life, they could always be here, here or here. God-centered life, principle-centered existence, as Stephen Covey puts it, is what assures that bumps in the road will be smoothed out by, by our attitudes of serenity, acceptance, gratitude, and equanimity. How do you get there, though? How do you get there? 
So Alevai, you should live from here and not experience suffering ever again. I'm sorry to say, not gonna happen. We have to start small. We have to start by recognizing that minor inconvenience does not pop my balloon of happiness. We have to recognize, we cannot, you can, we cannot accept, God forbid, a tragedy if we're not willing to accept a minor inconvenience. If we're going to fall apart at a broken cup or at a tra parking ticket or at somebody giving me a death stare or a stink eye, if that's going to destroy me, how am I going to take on the real tragedies of life? God forbid illness, my own or people I love, death. Financial losses, we can't go there without starting small. So what I would like you to do is to take the first step today. You have a pencil in front of you and you have a blank index card. Start by creating your grat gratitude list. Put on 10 items for which you are grateful today. Start by doing that. And when you are done, put it on your fridge and read it every day. And when that becomes obsolete, do it again. Do a new list. I invite you to do it. I think it's a very good exercise, and it is something practical you can take with you today. This is the first step in conquering suffering, being grateful. My wife just told me a story about a woman who suffered greatly, and someone told her to be grateful to God for one minute a day. And her life was turned around in the course of many months, maybe years, but her life was turned around, and she now tells this story by saying she now says 24 hours a day is not enough for me to express my gratitude for God for everything I say. So 10 point gratitude list. If you want to cheat, you can name all your children separately. But that is cheating, I'm telling you right now, that is cheating. That's right, there you go. Start with 10, 10 things. And so the first step in overcoming suffering is to decide to not suffer anymore. That doesn't mean suffering will not come. But we should all ask ourselves a question, what can I do that I would do that would, bring, that would alleviate my suffering even a little bit? What can I do that I would do that would alleviate my suffering even a little bit? So while you're working on your gratitude list, and it is something that you don't have to share, we're certainly not gonna get to share it today with anyone, and you don't have to put it on your fridge if uh, you are not brave enough to share it with the rest of your family who may mock you. So, but this is between you and your God. This is between you and your, and putting distance between you and suffering. Taking small steps. So, Smeichim surim is actually, the people who rejoice in suffering is actually a continuation of a longer expression of our sages that goes like this. Alubim vein olbim, shoimim herposom vein meishivim, oisim miyahvo usmeichim beisurim, aleim akosev oimer beoihov kitseisa shamesh beiburos. Which in Russian means this. I'm sorry, in English. Um, those who are insulted and do not insult back, those who hear derision but do not answer, and those who rejoice in suffering, those are the ones who are called lovers of God, and they will marry to be compared to the sun in its full might. What was the second category? I'm, I'm going to break it down in a second, because it goes like this. First category, those who are, so this is actually, what is the connection with these three things? Insulted, hear insults but do not insult back, Hear derision, but do not answer, and rejoice in suffering. These are actually steps that we should take towards rejoicing in suffering, accepting suffering with love. And the steps are like this. The first step is 
the very least, when you're being insulted, don't insult back. You can answer. You can say, you know what, what you just said hurts me. You can answer back. You can say, you cannot talk to me this way. It's okay to say that. But don't return an insult. Because that exacerbates your own suffering. Because now you are engaged with the people who are trying to inflict pain on you. You now engaged with them, and you are now increasing your own suffering. The second step is shoivim kirposim ein meishivim. They hear the reason but do not respond. The second step is not to disp learn to not to respond at all. You can hear the reason, but you don't have to engage at all. It goes completely above your head. That's the second step. Finally, the third step is rejoicing in suffering. It's saying, smechim surim. It's understanding that when somebody stands there and calls you names, somebody uh, you know, uh, makes holes in your car tires, uh, you know, somebody takes your sidr in shul, chas v'sholem, l'hoi But um, that is God patting you on the shoulder and saying, here I am, did you forget about me? So finally, I would like to conclude with this. Number one, please, please do not take what you learn here today by going to people who suffer, patting them on the shoulder and saying, accept it. Be happy. The worst thing you can do on the Shiva call is to sit next to somebody and say, so what are you grateful for today? <laughs> what are you grateful for today on the Shiva call? When other people suffer, we empathize, we validate. We say, I'm sorry for your pain. It must be so hard for you. I don't know what to say. And this, by the way, one of the reasons why on a Shiva call, you're not supposed to start talking until the person you're visiting talks first. Because what are you going to say? What are you going to say to make it all right? Accept it? Or well, you're not serene enough. If you were serene, you wouldn't be crying. So please, this is all about us. This is not about consoling people who are suffering. Consoling people who are suffering has to do with empathy, has to do with understanding, has to do with saying, I don't know what to say. And it's okay to say that. That, by the way, is very appropriate when you're visiting somebody who is grieving, who has just suffered the loss, is to say, it must be so hard, I don't know what to say. I have no words. And the very final point is that even for ourselves, even when we say pain is great and it propels you to great heights and it's a challenge you need to overcome to become a better human being, we do not go out of here praying for pain. We ask for God to send us goodness that is revealed, that is open, that is acceptable to us even on our limited level of where we have a duality of experience. We have a bad and we have the good, we have the darkness and we have the light. We want things to come to us in a revealed, open, good way. We don't want convoluted presence. That's why our Rebbe always stressed before Rosh Hashanah, based on the writings of the, his predecessor, the Friedrich Rebbe, that when we pray in the Machzer and Rosh Hashanah, we pray, we say, Open for us the goodness of your treasury. He says, you have to read it like this. Your treasury that is good for us, we ask you to open. Well, no, everything is your in your treasury is great. But some of it comes with thorns and thistles. We want goodness that is good for us. So we ask for open kindness. We don't ask for suffering. Viktor Frankl was also very, very strong on that point. We definitely don't ask for suffering. There's much meaning there is in suffering. We don't ask for pain. We ask for goodness for ourselves. We ask for goodness for others. And so with that, I want to thank you again for joining me today. I want to wish you goodness that is open, goodness that is revealed, goodness that is easy to perceive, that doesn't need calibrating and understanding and thinking, is it good, is it not so much? Let us all rejoice in that. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm here all day. Don't forget to tip your waitress. <laughs> Go ahead. OK. So. Questions? Tell me about it, Rabbi Kushner's paradox. Right, so this is something that I said at the beginning, I'm not going to address, but, uh, uh, but this, I think that this is, this is the same, that we, I, we really don't know why 
uh, it happens to good people around us. But what we could, should take from, from observing it is the lesson for us is learning from good people's reaction to, ba to bad things happening and by taking a lesson from ourselves. And perhaps it is also the reason that we see it, that we witness it, is the reason for us to, to call to God and to decry the unfairness of it, the seeming unfairness of it, and to beg uh, on behalf of that person. I think this is, the, this is a more practical application. And why bad things happen to good people, uh, you know, one day we'll know. But this day is not today. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? That's all. Just a second, Mendel. Okay, Mendel, go ahead. What do you mean, endure health? I don't think I said that. I think that my point about married people was uh, more of a joking one, is that when a woman is in labor, I said, she comes to understand what a man experiences when he has a cold. But I don't think that I made any distinction between the endurance of health between married men and married women. I'm not. Okay. Yeah, I think it's uh, health is a universal experience. That's all you were saying? Yes. Almost. Almost no suffering. This is an excellent point. So, so there are, I think there are two, two, the answer to that is twofold. So number one, I think that, that the meaning of the quote, whether it's Nietzsche or Frankel, is when you have a why, you can bear almost any how, that implies that you have an answer to the why. So that's but uh, If you just have a why, so on the one hand, we can say, if you, all you have is a why, and you can ask you, why, why, why me? You know, there's a song by Uncle Moshe who says, I, I, I hurt myself. And so the other person asks him, did you cry? He says, no. Well, did you laugh? He says, no. Well, did you when uh, looked up to heaven and said, why, why, why? He says, no. So what did you say? I said, gamzo letoiva. It's a song by uh, Uncle Moshe. Okay? So if you're only going, why, 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 that will increase suffering, absolutely. But I think there is also an idea that because we know everything comes from God and no bad come, descends from above, it's okay to know that there is an answer, I just don't know it yet. And I think that also, in a way, could mitigate your suffering. Any other questions? Um, if uh, you guys, uh, ladies and gentlemen, would like, I, I would like to show you my new office and introduce you to this Ranger Center. And um, that would be, a, I think, a good conclusion. And may my mother's nishoma have an aliyah. I think it would be a good thing for her. OK. Yeah. First gratitude for having this chus to have the place that Muttel and the like can give such classes. It is wonderful. Thank you. It's very you. special. Thank you. Thank you very much. I never wrote such a list in my life. See? Look what you did already. You right. already accomplished so much. That's right. Thank you.